Okay. So, yeah, I want to talk about uh, efficient simulations of low dimensional systems. And uh, in, as, as Roderick said, this is a continuation in a little bit what uh, uh, Steve White was talking about last week. So, let me start by showing the agenda. So, the, my, my program consists of uh, two lectures. So, the first one being now, the second one being at around 10.30, and uh, a tutorial with hands-on sessions where we uh, can apply whatever I'm talking about in, in the first two lectures. So, and this lecture here will focus on matrix product states and uh, how we can use matrix product states to study uh, topological phases of matter. Uh, and since I believe that uh, repetition is very good for learning, and also uh, a week probably gave you a lot of time to, uh, to forget a few things that Steve White was talking about, I want to start off by giving a review of uh, or about entanglement and matrix product states. Uh, that would be mostly stuff that you already heard last week. And then I want to shift to some slightly uh, new concept, namely that I want to show how we can use matrix product state for infinite systems. So basically how we can describe a translational invariant infinite system by just uh, um, keeping in mind uh, a few matrices. And using mostly this infinite matrix product state uh, scheme, I want to uh, show you some examples how we can extract you know, fingerprints of topological order and also some of the uh, defining properties directly from those matrix product states. Let me also note that there are notes on the website. So, so most of the things that I talk about uh, today is, is written, uh, written up here. So let me now start by... Uh, basically reviewing a few of the things that you already uh, heard about by, uh, by Steve White. We, we are interested in, in describing uh, quantum states. So we have just a, a pure quantum state that we denote by psi. And in its most general form, we can write it in, in, this, uh, in this, this shape here. So we have here this psi, which has many indices. So as you probably recall from Steve's lecture, this is a rank L tensor. Uh, and this rank L, L tensor is describing the quantum state in terms of some local basis. Right? So, so here we, we can think, for example, of a one-dimensional system where we just enumerate the sites from 1 to L. And on each site, we have some uh, local basis described by Jn. Uh, and this Jn is ranging from 1 to D. So D is something which we call the uh, local Hilbert space dimension. Say for a spin one half system, this is two. For a spin spin one system, this is three, etc. So so this is the most general form that we can use for writing down a uh, kind of many body um, state. So while this is like super general, it has a big drawback, namely. Um, if we want to store the full information that's contained in a wave function, we have to kind of, uh, keep track of this huge object and the, um, the size or the, the memory that we need to store such an object is scaling exponentially with the system size. So, so if we're just using this form, we usually can only consider relatively small systems. And as you saw last week, for maybe a spin one-half system, we can reach using this technique by just exactly writing down the wave function, maybe up to 40 or so spin one half. However, uh, we can use some concepts, uh, concepts of, uh, that are known from, from quantum information uh, to basically compress these states. And uh, this is what you already learned. There's actually a, a lot of uh, information contained in this way of writing down the state that we are not necessarily interested in. And there's a way that we can just uh, compress states. And the idea how we can compress these states is uh, related to the um, Schmidt decomposition of a state. So what do we do for this Schmidt decomposition is we just take our system. So again, we just choose here a one-dimensional system. 
where we just cut it into two halves. So we just uh, pick a bond, and then we just say that, well, everything left of this bond is subsystem A, and everything right of this bond is subsystem B. And now we just uh, rewrite our wave function in this form. So we just write a wave function as uh, in, in, in with respect to a basis that we can choose for subsystem A and a basis subsystem B uh, with some coefficient matrix. Right? Just for clarity, if we just uh, have uh, just a spin one half system, we could just uh, have a basis of sigma z eigenstates here, like up, down, up, down on the left and up, down, up, down, whatever on the right. And this is describing basis for the left and for the right. And this is the uh, coefficient matrix. And what we can do now, and I think this is something that you did already last week, is we can perform a singular value decomposition of this coefficient matrix. And this gives us a unitary transformation of the local basis on the left and the local basis on the right to a basis in which the coefficient matrix is diagonal. That looks familiar to most of you? Good. <laughs> Good. So we have this particular form. So we have a so-called Schmidt decomposition in which we decompose the quantum state into a superposition of product states with respect to um, subsystem A and subsystem B. Good. Uh, and this will turn out to be very useful for compressing these quantum states. Let me first found out a quantity, which again you heard about last week. And this is a so-called uh, um, entanglement entropy. So the entanglement entropy is actually a measure for how much two um, subsystems are entangled. Right? Um, what, again, entanglement is a concept that you heard about already last week. It's the idea um, um, if a state is not entangled, then a state can be written as a simple product state between subsystem A and subsystem B. That is, in this decomposition that I'm writing here, we actually would have only a single term. Right? So we would just have a sum which consists only of one term. So we just have uh, whatever is the state on the left times whatever is on the state on the right. However, if we have entanglement in the system, so if we have entanglement between the left and the right half, then automatically we have several terms in this sum uh, um, because the state defined only on the left half, say, is, is in a mixed state. And the measure for how much entangled a state is is the entanglement entropy. And roughly we can say that the more entangled a state is, the more terms we need to keep in this sum to have a good representation of a state. And in fact, again, this is probably what you learned last week, is that this way of writing down the entanglement entropy is exactly equivalent of uh, looking at the uh, von Neumann entropy for the reduced density matrix. And a nice exercise to just visualize it is if you actually use this representation of the state and you write down the reduced density matrix, you immediately see that um, the uh, Schmidt states are actually eigenstates of the reduced density matrix with eigenvalues that are just uh, lambda alpha squared. Good. So this is just uh, defining what a Schmidt decomposition is and relating it to the entanglement entropy. And the Schmidt decomposition will be something very useful for compressing quantum states in a, in a moment. Let me, for this, point out some uh, very interesting or important uh, property of ground states of, of local Hamiltonians. And this is, they fulfill the so-called area law. And the area law has, or means in terms of the um, entanglement entropy in one-dimensional systems, that the entanglement entropy uh, as a function of the system size for this kind of bipartition into two half chains becomes independent of the system size. Why is this uh, very uh, remarkable? If we would not look at the uh, ground state of a local Hamiltonian, but instead we would just take a random state, like just, just randomly define a 
uh, a state in, in your Hilbert space that you have on this system, and you do this kind of by partition, you would actually find that the entanglement entropy would be proportional to L. Right? And drawing a picture like this for a random state would mean that we have just uh, the spins in our system, say if we're looking at a spin system, are randomly entangled. So all kinds of, so, 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 so the spins in a random state, they wouldn't know if they're close to a cut or very far away, they would just be entangled equally. So as we grow the system, we would actually notice that all states, all spins that we add would contribute to the entanglement, and thus we would find that the entanglement entropy would grow linearly with, um, um, with the length of the system. For ground states of local Hamiltonians, however, we can have this cartoon picture in mind. We can just think, well, we have a local Hamiltonian, and the local Hamilton, or like the ground state, will minimize the energy for this local Hamiltonian, which means we will mostly have local fluctuations in the spin, in, 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 in the state. And this is what I visualize here by these um, bonds. If you, for example, want to think about a, uh, a charged, like a system with charges in it, or like, or like we could say that, well, a uh, Hamiltonian once kind of can lower the kinetic energy by having particles hopping between neighboring sites. And then we would find that, well, uh, a charge that is sitting somewhere near the boundary, there's a good probability that there's some quantum fluctuation taking it on the other side. But if we have a charge sitting like super far away from this cut, um, uh, um, the likelihood that that particular charge uh, fluctuates to the other side of the cut is, is very, um, very small. Good. So with this, I just want to give you some intuition of how we can think of uh, like a cartoon picture for how we can think kind of ground states of local Hamiltonians look like. And this motivates sort of the, um, the, the area law that gives us some idea why we find this area law. Though these are just simple pictures, they're actually relatively rigorous proofs, at least for one dimensional system, that this area law exists. And uh, as far as I know, this has only been strictly proven for one dimensional uh, gap systems, but uh, it's more conjectured for higher dimensional systems also. Good. So this is, yes? What is it? Why do they need gaps to think for this? Why I well, the, the reason that I put um, gap here is that if the system is not gapped, and we have, for example, uh, a one-dimensional gapless system, we would have corrections to the area law. So uh, if we have a one-dimensional critical system, the entanglement entropy will actually um, grow um, logarithmically with, um, with the length of the system which means the picture that I've drawn here is in some approximation still true, except that what I'm trying to draw here is something that decays exponentially fast, giving us this area law where we have a constant. If we had a system with algebra algebraic correlations, this would just decay algebraically, and uh, we would just have uh, some, some, some longer range uh, uh, entanglement. And, uh, and all this has also a lot of consequences for the, uh, for the way that we can compress states, but we come to this in a moment. Okay. Yes? What about longest gap Hamiltonian? Longest gap? Long ranged. Well, once the Hamiltonian is not local, uh, this picture does no longer apply. Because, I mean, this is a, this is a very good question, because um, uh, um, the locality of the Hamiltonian is, is extremely important for all the arguments that I'm making here. Once you have a Hamiltonian where you allow for... So, so you could, for example, just take the extreme case and you just take a Hamiltonian that just has random couplings between all L sites. Um, then we don't, wouldn't even know how to define dimensionality. Right? So, so, so all, everything I'm saying here is relying on having... Hamiltonian that are um, either local or have um, long-range interactions that are decaying very quickly. So we could just, for example, have uh, some uh, uh, um, long-range but fast decaying um, correlations uh, and interactions. Good. Now, 
I already kind of pointed out several times that this is like some very special property. Um, and as I said also, if I just um, take my vast uh, many-body Hilbert space and I pick a random state, it has, uh, has a volume law. But the, um, the kind of part of, of the Hilbert space that has this, uh, this, this area law is like a tiny, tiny corner in this Hilbert space. And the proportion that I'm drawing here is definitely wrong because this kind of red dot you wouldn't even be able to see with your um, bare eyes. <laughs> So, and, uh, and, and, and these states have this particular property that they have an area law. And this is now something very powerful that we can say, right? So, we, we said, or we know from this area law, that all ground states of gapped and local Hamiltonians will, have, will be in this very tiny, tiny corner of the Hilbert space. And this is now a very useful thing to do, because if or a useful thing to have, because if we um, have a Hamiltonian and we want to find the ground state of this Hamiltonian, in principle, and this is what we are doing when performing exact diagonalization, we are constructing this huge many-body uh, Hilbert space that just uh, kills the computer immediately once we go to more than 40 spins. However, we are only interested in this tiny corner if we are only interested in the, in the ground state properties. And this is now what matrix product states uh, can do for us. They actually provide a way to describe this tiny corner efficiently. So if we are interested in the ground state, we can just use this as some sort of uh, uh, um, variational space which we just can explore and we, we know that we're going to find the, the correct ground state. And let me just demonstrate this, uh, um, this argument again. If we now pick a random state from, from your um, Hilbert space. And in fact, for those who like to uh, maybe play, play with the computer, you can just generate a random vector uh, and, uh, and, and perform a Schmidt decomposition of this random vector for a given bipartition. And what you're going to observe is this. So you just find that the um, Schmidt values here are roughly equal. So, so all of them have roughly the same size. And that means this state is very much entangled because you need many, many terms to express the, the, this random state. Let us now do the same experiment that I've done here for a random state, but now for a uh, ground state of a local Hamiltonian. So here I find the um, ground state of the um, uh, sort of a transverse field Ising model, which we're going to describe or discuss later. And do a Schmidt decomposition as, as shown here. Uh, and what you see here is that um, this, the, the Schmidt values decay extremely rapidly. So only taking into account 20 or so of these um, Schmidt states gives us an extremely good approximation of, this, of the state. Like note that there is some exponential or like a logarithmic scale on this axis here. So, so just looking at this picture, we see that there's a very good way of approximating a state by just uh, truncating this uh, Schmidt decomposition. And one illustrative uh, example that I like to show is this one here. Namely, instead of uh, thinking that, because what I mentioned earlier, we have this uh, coefficient matrix Cij. And Cij is describing our quantum state in terms of a local basis on the left and a local basis on the right. And now we can instead think that these Cij's represent uh, a photograph, right? So basically, these Cij's could be a matrix that encodes the grayscale of these pixels. So if there's a small number, it means it's maybe mostly black. And if it's a, a large number, it's mostly white. Good. So we can now encode, instead of a quantum state, a photograph into this coefficient matrix. And then we can do the following we can perform a Schmidt decomposition, or alternatively a singular value decomposition of this matrix, which decomposes this matrix into the product of a unitary times a diagonal times a unitary matrix. And then we can truncate this decomposition. We can say that, well, instead of taking into account all states here, like or all singular values, which would give the exact matrix back, 
we're only keeping those with the largest magnitude. And then we can just see by our eyes how good this approximation is. So let's do this. So we just uh, take this picture, which has uh, roughly maybe 1,200 pixels. So the, um, uh, the full dimension would be 1,200. But now we just keep only four out of these 1,200 states. And this is what we get. Um, roughly, we don't see much. <laughs> but if we take 16 out of these 1,200, we get already a pretty decent approximation. At least we can see that we are uh, uh, dealing here with a bridge. If you're taking 64, we already see most of the details. So what we see here is that just by taking into account 64 out of these 1,200 uh, points, or like uh, um, singular values, we get a pretty good approximation of our original image. And the rest will just add some, some details to this. So this is basically some uh, 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 kind of a visual way of seeing how we can compress um, states or, or photos. And there's actually a funny fact that some images are less entangled than others. And there's one artist called Mondrian, who is a, a Dutch artist. And he draws these pictures here. And these are, in a very good approximation, product pictures. So these can be approximated by only um, one uh, Schmidt value, except these gray block boxes. If there were not these gray boxes, these are exact product pictures. Good. So much about the uh, uh, images. Let us now come back to, um, to these quantum states. Um, um, there's actually a way how we can then um, use these insights to compress states. And roughly speaking, or the, the basic idea is now to just take a um, quantum state like, um, that, that we can write using this form. You actually have a question. I mean, how, how familiar are you with this uh, way or this graphical way of representing tensors? Because this will be uh, relatively important later on in my lecture. Is this familiar to you? Who's, who is not familiar with um, this way of writing the states? OK, these are. So Steve White did not talk about this way of representing tensors? OK, so maybe then, again, let me just repeat this. I, I like repetition, so. <laughs> Good. So, so let us now come back to um, what I said um, earlier, because like at the very beginning of my, my talk, I was just talking about the most general way that we can represent a quantum state, which is by just writing the state in terms of these uh, coefficients in the many-body wave function. Right? So if we just store those coefficients in front of the um, kind of many-body basis, then we just keep the full information of, uh, of the state. But with the drawback that this is a monstrous big thing that we don't want to deal with. Um, and now, when we deal with these um, tensor product states or matrix product states, there's a very convenient way of um, writing um, these, these tensors. And this is with this graphical way of, of doing this. And since it's not clear to everyone, let me just briefly uh, review these ideas. So when we have some object, which could be maybe just some uh, 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 vector v, we have like one index here. So this is just a, a vector with one index. And the way that I, from now on, going to write these objects, it would just be um, a circle with a line coming out. And this line coming out is basically just this index. So if we have a matrix, it's like M, I, J, and this would be just a circle with two lines coming out. And they are denoting this index. The last one I'm going to do is uh, if we have something with three indices, i, j, k, we draw a circle with three <laughs> lines coming out, i, j, k. Good. So at this level, this is only mildly helpful because we don't have to write these um, uh, indices. But where this becomes uh, extremely useful is once we uh, talk about vector, like um, tensor contractions and operations that we're doing with these objects. And this is... For example, when writing a, a, a matrix matrix um, product, so we have M, I, J, N, J, K, 
uh, and then we have here the sum over j. The way that we represent uh, this is we just have two objects, each of them having two legs coming out, and this tensor contraction here that we just sum over this index, we just draw by, by connecting objects by, by a line. And again, for things as simple, it's still neatly written down in both ways, but once the objects become um, bigger, if we, for example, have some network which might look something like this, writing it in a sum will already become uh, sufficiently messy. And then it's much more elegant and need to, to write work with this graphical um, um, uh, notation. So, and, and using now this notation, the uh, coefficient in this many-body wave function uh, will, it, it, it is a kind of rank L tensor, which just corresponds to having a blob with L legs sticking out. Let us now come to the idea how we can compress this state. We can now do a series of uh, Schmidt decompositions. And the way that we can do this is we start first by the original state, the, the state that we had here. And now we can just uh, perform a Schmidt decomposition between the first spin and the rest. Uh, then we can just write down the Schmidt decomposition, where in this case, this A exactly corresponds to the unitary matrix that we get from our singular value decomposition. And then we have here the Schmidt values, and this is now the, 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 the right Schmidt states. And then we just take our right Schmidt states and perform another decomposition here. Right. So now we see that we can just uh, successively do uh, Schmidt decompositions of, of, of this state and just uh, rewrite our state. And what we've achieved here is we started from a state that was a um, uh, uh, one rank L tensor. And we just decomposed it here into a product of L rank 3 tensors. So, so here I'm using exactly this notation. Yes? Oh, yes, this is, you can also think about a circle. It's just that I found it, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, so I just um, use triangles, circles, or squares. The, the reason that I'm using triangles here, it's just, uh, there's no particular reason, actually. Yeah. It's just that I liked it better, I guess. But, but the, the shape of these blobs has no meaning. I mean, here I use a square and triangles, circles. So you probably see different variations throughout, but it's the only important thing is how many legs are, are sticking out. Good. And, and now we see that well, we can actually, if we kind of do this uh, 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 decomposition, and at each state we keep the full Schmidt spectrum, if we keep all states, then this transformation from here to here is in exact. But the... Um, uh, uh, um, but we also haven't kind of gained anything because um, as we go to the center of the system, the number of Schmidt states that we have to take into account will actually grow exponentially. So instead of having an object like a rank L tensor with uh, an exponential number of entries, we just trade it in for having a product of exponentially big matrices. Okay, so, so here basically we just do a rewriting of, of this state. But, and this is now the, the, the motivation for matrix product states, is that at each state we can actually just have a look at these Schmidt values, like these lambdas, and then we could say that, well, if they are like really small, we just neglect them, like, and we expect this to be the case for ground states of local Hamiltonians, and then we have actually uh, a way to compress states. So, so this is already some sort of a helpful um, thing to do if you have maybe a, a limited use or limited time to use a very big computer. You could do exact diagonalization on your favorite problem, uh, get this huge object, and then you run this sort of compression algorithm by successively doing these Schmidt decompositions and just um, uh, forget about the information that's not relevant. And then you can just take home 
the, um, the, this form of a state where you just have this rank 3 tensor where you know that after multiplying all these rank 3 tensors, you get your state back. This is not a very helpful thing, but this is more just than a way how we can think of um, matrix product states as being something that uh, 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 kind of efficiently can compress states in, can, can compress states that have only low entanglement. So this is now the um, idea of matrix product states that, as I kind of maybe demonstrated, both with this uh, photograph of the Golden Gate Bridge and this kind of compression algorithm is that we can actually, um, uh, we have a good reason to believe that the amplitudes in a kind of slightly entangled many-body wave function can be efficiently represented in this form. So, and what we have achieved then is that we started from some object that has a two to the L dimension. So that's something that's exponentially, oh, sorry, the d, two should be a D here. I'm just gonna fix it later. So if we start off from something that has a D to the L dimensional Hilbert space, so we just need a, a lot of memory to store this information, we just cooked it down to something that's uh, L times D times chi squared, where I assume that I just keep only chi uh, singular values or Schmidt values when compressing the state. And what I've just argued here based on, uh, on these more intuitive uh, 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 reason reasonings can actually be proven uh, mathematically. So we, uh, we can actually um, show that states with um, low entanglement can be represented efficiently in this form. Since this has been discussed last week, let me just uh, um, check who, who, who thinks that this is relatively clear what a matrix product state is. Okay, this is uh, probably enough. <laughs> Good. So, so, so we have a way to uh, represent quantum states uh, uh, efficiently. And this concept um, that we can do for quantum states, namely that we uh, write a, um, kind of a rank L tensor as a product of uh, rank three tensors can be generalized to operators, right? So we can just think of uh, an operator acting on our Hilbert space, or like a many-body operator acting on our Hilbert space as a, as a rank 2L tensor, right? So where we have here uh, the indices on, on the, the lowest, like uh, where we act on, and then this is what we get out. And again, we can just play the same game that we did for a quantum state, and uh, uh, rewrite it in a product of, in this case, rank four tensor. So everything is the same that we have for uh, states. We can do for um, matrix product or for operators. Uh, and again, many of the important operators that we're interested in, for example, local Hamiltonians, can be um, represented exactly in this form with a relatively small bond dimension. So if you for example, have a Hamiltonian of the Heisenberg model, you can just represent it in a uh, matrix product operator where the bond dimension here is just uh, five. Good, and with these tools that you uh, learned about last week, we can then, uh, or, or Steve White, <laughs> introduce the, uh, um, the DMRG algorithm. And we can see the DMRG algorithm as just a sort of a variational approach, a variational optimization of these uh, tensors. So with this reasoning that I gave before, I hope that I could convince you that those states that we're interested in, namely the ground states of local Hamiltonians, in particular gap local Hamiltonians, can be efficiently represented in terms of matrix product states. And DMRG is then the method that allows you to find those states. And using these graphical representation, DMIG looks very simple, it's just this here. So we just say that, well, we can just take our Hamiltonian, which we can represent in terms of this matrix product operator, this uh, product of those uh, uh, rank four tensors, uh, and we just take the expectation value of, the, uh, of this Hamiltonian um, with respect to, these, uh, to, to a trial state, and, and this gives us the energy. And now what DMRG 
basically does, it just takes out, uh, just fixes all the tensors here and just optimizes one tensor here to minimize the energy. And once it found the, uh, the minimum, which can be done by using some uh, linear optimization techniques, we just shift to the next matrix, find the minimum, and this way uh, one is then sweeping from left to right to the system until it converged to the lowest energy state that we can find, and this is then the, um, uh, um, the best approximation of the ground state that we can get for a given uh, matrix product state, or like for, for a matrix product state with a given one dimension. Say it again. The, oh, this one here? Well, the, this one here is basically just, um, uh, so when you have, I, again, I, I assume that this had been discussed by, by Steve White. If you have a, um, a matrix product operator, then you need to terminate it on the left and on the right. And this is actually done by, by doing this. So if you have, uh, uh, because if you just have your matrix product operator, then you have like some dangling drop dimension here and here, and you want to terminate it somehow. Basically, you want to uh, start here with a V, say, left and uh, V right. And this is encoded in, in this guy here. And the reason that this is connected up here uh, for a simple so for the simple case of just a one-dimensional system, this would be just some identity, or you could in fact just forget about this one and have just an identity um, up here. Yes. Well, there are various kinds of uh, DMRG, but at least conceptually, or the way that I'm writing it down here, the simplest version would be to just uh, optimize one matrix at a time. But we can, as you said, also do two, three, or four matrices and optimize them at a time. And in fact, choosing two matrices at a time instead of one has certain advantages for, for the algorithm, but also certain disadvantages. It's, uh, there, there are many trade-offs. To, to do this. And well, let me just comment briefly on this. The reason, or like when you are doing this um, so called kind of single site update, DMRG, the way that this is shown here, has the advantage that the, uh, uh, the scaling is, 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 is favorable because the effective Hamiltonian that you write down for a single, like again using this graphical notation, so this would be the kind of effective Hamiltonian in terms of the DMRG language that you have to deal with. And it has a dimension of uh, uh, chi, chi, chi squared times D. But if you were to do the two-side update, you have just um, two here. And then you would have, uh, uh, like the, the dimension of this effective Hamiltonian is a chi squared times D squared. So then this one would be uh, slower in general. However, if you just use a single site update, um, there can arise certain problems because of you, uh, um, um, uh, it might just get stuck more easily. So then one need to prevent a little bit more so problems. Right, exactly, this is the point. Like if you are using um, this, this approach here, the entanglement, like if you start from a state with a relatively small bond dimension, the bond dimension would never grow in this one here, which means you would have to apply some other algorithm to seed in some, uh, some entanglement into the state. That's correct. But this is then slightly faster if you do this uh, carefully, but this one is also a bit more dangerous because it might just get stuck. The reason why I'm showing this simplest one is because I like that here we have a very simple um, picture of DMRG and we can get an idea how, how, what, what the main ideas uh, and the, the main idea of just basically fixing everything in the uh, matrix product state except a few, in this case one or maybe two or maybe three matrices, the main concept or the main principle um, remains the same.
Yes. And then what we expect to do when we go to the state. Okay, I can very briefly uh, elaborate a little bit on this question. So, it basically said you what you we said. So first, we start from a guess, or maybe like from a uh, a random state. Now you could say that you start the algorithm somewhere at your uh, maybe somewhere on the towards the left, and then you just construct the so-called effective Hamiltonian that um, would have, I don't know, I just do it. So then we have here alpha, beta, i, alpha prime, i prime, beta prime, and then I can put these indices here also, alpha, i, beta, uh, alpha prime, uh, i prime, beta prime. So I just contract these tensors together. Like I just contract all these tensors that I have. Like these are being the tensors from my, from my matrix product state, and these ones being the tensors from my matrix product operator. And after I contract all those, I get just something that I um, can write down as a matrix, right? I have a matrix that acts on, on this space spanned by the uh, states alpha, beta, and i. Now I can just use a standard exact diagonalization technique to find the ground state of this matrix. And the ground state, basically I can write eight times, like I use a on this particular bond, is just uh, E naught times a state described by this matrix A. And once I've kind of done this optimization, I just say, okay, let me now just plug in this matrix. Let me just call this maybe A tilde. I just plug in matrix A tilde here, A tilde star, and I move on to the next bond. Do the same game again. I just uh, construct my effective Hamiltonian, plug it into my favorite uh, kind of uh, sparse matrix diagonalization program, find the, the ground state, plug it in, and then I just do this um, sweeping algorithm. Yeah. And as pointed out, um, this, the problem with the single side update is that the bond dimension will never increase. If I start with a, I, I start with a guess of an MPS that has a bond dimension of five, I will always, uh, be stuck in this um, space. But, uh, and the details I'm not going to explain now because then I probably can talk the rest of the day about details of DMG. So, good. So unless there are further questions about the, um, the review part of DMG, I want to come to something uh, new now. Good. And the idea that I want to discuss uh, in, in a bit more detail now is the idea that we can do DMRG directly on an um, infinite system. And conceptually, not much is changing. It's just that um, this is some technique that I find um, helpful for, uh, for simulations. And this is something that I want to discuss in more detail now. So let us now uh, assume that we have an infinite system. And uh, uh, for now, it's completely translational invariant. So every site um, is, is supposed to be the same. And this idea can be very easily generate, generated, uh, uh, generalized to, to a system with a unit cell. We could also say that we have a translational invariant system with a unit cell of uh, n sites. <coughs> and the main point is just that we remove these indices. Like in this like these kind of finite size matrix product states, we have these indices here enumerating these matrices. Now I'm just saying that, well, I'm looking at states that have the same matrix everywhere. Um, that's already the, um, the main idea, but it's very simple. And I want to um, show how we can actually um, nicely work with these uh, states. Because you see the problem, right? If I say I'm working with an infinite system where every side or every, on every side we have the same matrix, on the one hand, it's really nice because we just 
lo we are losing this factor L. So instead of having L times D times chi squared uh, variational parameters, we now only have D times chi squared. So that's nice. But uh, the problem that we might ask is like, well, if, if I, for example, have a Hamiltonian, how do I actually uh, calculate the energy of this Hamiltonian? Or if I want to measure just some local observable, how can I actually do this? Because in principle, I would have to multiply infinitely many of those matrices um, before I can read off anything. And I want to use now this as some sort of an excuse to just explain a little bit more about um, some arithmetic with matrix product state. So one important insight is that for a matrix product state, so the matrices are actually not um, uniquely defined. So if I say that I have a matrix product state describing a particular state, then what I can do is I can just construct another matrix product state by just transforming my matrices. So I have here A tilde, and these A tilde are just given by X times A I times uh, uh, X, uh, the inverse of X. Right? And X is just being some invertible matrix. And what we notice is that if we write down the matrix product state X uh, or A, A tilde, we can actually, we would definitely find the same state because the um, X's just uh, uh, cancel each other, right? So, so by just uh, this simple reasoning, I can show, uh, we, we, we notice that a matrix product state uh, kind of representation is not unique. Good. Um, and let us um, use this actually for us. And we can actually find now a, a representation of a matrix product state that will be extremely useful. And uh, for this, we're actually using this degree of freedom that we have to choose our matrices by choosing it such that the bond index uh, will directly correspond to the Schmidt decomposition. Recall, we just uh, do a Schmidt decomposition of our system into a kind of left part and right part uh, by cutting the system at a given bond in this form here. And also recall that the Schmidt states are forming an orthogonal basis. So uh, the Schmidt states for different uh, alphas here are um, orthogonal. So, and uh, uh, this is like what we want to do. We want to choose our matrix product state representation in such a way that the bond index corresponds directly to a Schmidt decomposition. And this is the one step. And the second step that I want to do is I want to just uh, introduce a slightly different, but I think very useful way of writing matrix product states. And the idea is the following. We just write the, uh, the tensors that we have in our matrix product state as a product of a diagonal matrix, um, lambda, uh, alpha, beta, um, which is a diagonal matrix that contains the Schmidt states, uh, sorry, the Schmidt values, and we have some tensors uh, gamma, alpha, j, um, which actually relate the local basis and the Schmidt basis. And then we just write down our state in, in this form. Namely, we have here these lambda tensors on a bond, and these lambda tensors are carrying the Schmidt values for a Schmidt decomposition of this matrix product state at this given bond. And these um, values gamma um, are those kind of tensors relating the Schmidt and the local basis. And again, this is something we can always do. We can always just uh, 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 split up a matrix A into a product of a matrix, uh, um, of a diagonal matrix with the Schmidt values and uh, a matrix gamma. Good. Uh, and if we actually choose this particular, or like the way that we want to choose the um, matrix product state is such that we can just uh, terminate our matrix product state at a given bond and then automatically get the Schmidt decomposition. Let me just graphically show this maybe. So we have our state. Um, psi being represented as a matrix product state where we have here gamma, lambda, gamma, lambda, gamma, lambda, gamma, lambda. And now we could say that, well, 
Oh, I forgot these symbols. Let us now take only everything left here. So we have alpha here, alpha, uh, beta, oh, sorry. Uh, then we have alpha, alpha, because this is just a diagonal matrix. And then this is actually the Schmidt decomposition. So these ones here are now a matrix product state representation of the Schmidt state for the left. And everything here are the Schmidt states alpha to the right. So this is a quite convenient way of writing down the matrix product state such that we can always, just by uh, multiplying a part of these matrices, we just get exactly the, um, the Schmidt state for a bipartition at this given bond. Good. And from this, we can, we now recognize a certain uh, uh, condition that we get for our matrix product state. And this is because of the orthogonality of those matrix products, uh, of these uh, Schmidt states. So we want, or the, we know that the Schmidt states are orthogonal. So uh, lambda uh, um, alpha prime alpha is, is just a delta function. So we want to have the product of those two matrix product states to be also uh, um, a delta function, right? So you recognize that what we are doing here is actually just the product of two matrix product, like the, 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 um, the scalar product of two, two matrix product states. Does this make sense? So, and now we can, somehow the color coding comes are not quite right. <laughs> um, so, we define now the following object, and which is something we call the transfer matrix. So, the transfer matrix is just we take um, this part here, like some uh, gamma lambda and gamma star lambda. So, this is what we call the transfer matrix. Um, we just write down, so we just define a transfer matrix that will be um, alpha alpha prime beta beta prime, and this is and we have index alpha alpha prime beta beta prime. Okay, so th this is now the um, transfer matrix for a given matrix product state. And let me ask you, so, so the, the product of those uh, Schmidt states written in terms of these matrix product states, so corresponds to multiplying many, many of these transfer matrices. And If we want this to be true for an infinite system, we want that the uh, um, that the product of those many transfer matrices eventually just gives us just the uh, just the identity. And so maybe I have a uh, a question to you: If I just multiply a matrix, so if I just multiply a matrix uh, over and over again and I just apply this operator to some vector, what is left? Right, exactly. So we just, if we just uh, multiply a matrix again and again, this is actually the so-called power method, which you can use to find the dominant eigenvector of a matrix. So applying this to uh, this idea, we see that, well, in order to be the, um, to, to actually, in order for a matrix product state to produce kind of orthogonal states, we want that the dominant eigenvector of the transfer matrix is the identity. And we want this to be true to the right and to the left. So using uh, the graphical representation, we actually find now a condition for our matrix product state, um, which we can call the kind of canonical form, is such that the left and the right transfer matrices that we uh, obtain have a dominant eigenvector, uh, which is the 
our identity. And this actually defines our matrix product state uh, um, up to some overall phase. Because I mentioned previously, we had a matrix product state, and we said that, well, the, matrix, the matrices are not, uh, not, not well defined. So basically, we have a lot of degrees of freedom. But if we say that, well, we have a matrix product state given, and it's in this canonical form, it's actually um, uh, um, kind of uniquely defined up to some, some phase factors. So, and uh, this is again what I said, now written in this formula here. So we say that the left and the right transfer matrix have a dominant eigenvalue one, and the corresponding eigenvector is the identity. Good. And, yes? Okay, let me just, yes, good, good question. I was maybe too fast on this. Uh, this object here, as you said, is a for, for index object. But I can, in principle, just reshape it as a, as a matrix. So I could say that, well, just using my favorite graphical representation, I have some object which is a for index guy. But I can now just basically group these indices together. And by this, it becomes a regular um, matrix. And I will find that the um, kind of corresponding eigenvector will be the um, identity here. It's just basically by merging indices. You just take two chi-dimensional indices, and you just transform it to a chi-squared dimensional vector. And graphically, this is just nicely just shown here, you just uh, have this object which you think of some uh, uh, matrix applied to uh, a vector, and this vector is just the identity. Good. Yeah, after these rather formal uh, uh, discussions, I want to just show some examples. So let us start with something extremely simple, which is just we have an Ising ferromagnet. So the Ising ferromagnet is clearly just a, uh, a product state. So what would be the uh, bond dimension that we need to represent this state exactly? So if we have a product state, one. it's one. <laughs> and the local dimension would be two, right? So because it's just a local degree of freedom of up or down. And in this case, it's very simple. So we have just uh, simple numbers. So we have some gamma up, and this is one. We have a gamma down, this is zero. And because the state is normalized on each bond, we just have, uh, have, uh, have one Schmidt value that is one. So, and this um, represents our uh, trivial um, product state, and clearly it uh, fulfills this condition of being uh, uh, in this canonical form. Let's now move on to a slightly more complicated state. And uh, in fact, this state here, the so-called uh, Affleck, Kennedy, Lieb, and Tasaki state, is sort of the, um, the mother of matrix product states. So, so before matrix product states were formally introduced, uh, Affleck, Kennedy, Lieb, and Tasaki wrote down a, a model to which the ground state is an exact matrix product state. They didn't call it this way. So, so the idea is we take a, a, a simple spin one Hamiltonian. So the first part is just the spin one Heisenberg Hamiltonian, and the second part is just the uh, biquadratic uh, term. And it turns out if you fine tune uh, this Hamiltonian to this point, where, uh, where the, the prefactor of the biquadratic term is, uh, is one third, this Hamiltonian can actually be rewritten as just the sum of projection operators on, acting on each bond on uh, the spin equals to two state. If you have some spare time, you can actually show that this Hamiltonian exactly corresponds to the sum of projectors. Was it? That's essential. Yeah, the, the thing is that if you have this prefactor one, one, 1 over 3, you can actually um, show that this exactly corresponds to a projector onto a s equals to 2 state. 
That's correct. If you, um, well, again, I could talk a long time about this model here, but the um, the main point is like if you look at the uh, the phase diagram, basically of this, it if you just set it to one over four, the model stays in the same phase, and a lot of the physics will remain exactly the same as what's predicted by this simple state that I'm going to discuss in a minute. However, if you tune it to one one over four, the this state, like the, the simple matrix product state solution, will not be an exact eigenstate anymore. And again, it's a, it's a nice exercise to, to just sit down and show that if you take this Hamiltonian, plus actually a constant of 2 over 3, I think, uh, then plus or minus, it, it is actually exactly just the sum of projection operators onto the S equals to 2 state. Good. So, so we have this Hamiltonian, and what uh, Affleck, Kennedy, Lieb, and Tazaki managed to show is that this Hamiltonian has a very simple solution. And this solution is the following. So they take each of these um, spin one sides. So each of these circles is now a spin one. And each spin one is split up into two spin one halves, like uh, these dots here. And the, uh, um, the spin one halves that we have in uh, uh, or these kind of uh, virtual spin one halves they are forming singlets, like spin one half singlets, with the neighboring side. Right? So, so this is the cartoon picture of, of this state. So this state, as I said, has now an exact matrix product state representation. So we can, again, uh, try to figure out what is the uh, physical dimension of this matrix product state. It's a spin one degree of freedom per side, which makes three states, so, so small d would be three. And what is the bond dimension? So we see that the state has, at each bond, we cut a singlet. And if we just do a Schmidt decomposition of a singlet, we need how many states? Two states. So we, so we already know just by the geometry, or like how I introduced the state, that the bond dimension will be two, and the uh, uh, physical dimension is three. So we can then actually sit down uh, and based on this picture that I've shown before to construct a matrix product state that has exactly this uh, property that we have um, uh, singlets between the two neighboring sides. That's very simple. And then we can apply these ideas that I showed earlier to bring it in this canonical form. And uh, then is this, this is what I found. Please <laughs> sit down and check that this is actually correct. Um, but what we, what, we, what we then have is that, well, first of all, we see that the state is certainly normalized, because if I just uh, 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 I take the, the trace of the squared, I get 1. And uh, it's supposed to be, these matrices are supposed to be chosen in such a form that they actually fulfill this condition for the um, canonical form. So if you just plug it into this equation, if you take those matrices, uh, contract them to get the transfer matrix, you should find that you have a matrix which has a dominant eigenvector um, that is 1, or I get the identity with an eigenvalue of 1. Good. So, so now we have some examples of the, uh, uh, of the, um, uh, of the, the matrix product states that we have given. Yes. Let me now come uh, how we can actually use these matrix product states now to do some uh, uh, algebra. And for this, I want to uh, just give you some idea how we can uh, do these calculations. Yes? Uh, is it possible to transfer all of the empty state into uh, Kanakar form? You have Kanakar form for all of the Right. So, so this, is, uh, this is true. So you can, you can take a given matrix product state, if, if you just uh, find a matrix product state or someone gives a matrix product state to you, you can always um, transform it to this particular form. Yes. There are some, well, we, I come to some small exception in a second, but, uh, but generically, like if you have a, have a state, you can always um, use this, uh, this machinery to bring it into this form. Yeah. Good. And now I want to uh, discuss a little bit the following. But so far, I basically showed that we um, 
have matrix product states, they are an efficient representation for these, um, these uh, 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 kind of for, for area law states. And uh, I just introduced this canonical form. And I went to want to show now or demonstrate this, this is actually a quite useful form to, to have uh, uh, your MPS in. And I want to just show you how we can evaluate expectation values with these. This is evaluation of expectation values. So, and this I'm doing because this uh, arithmetic with these um, infinite MPS can be, I think, quite, quite useful. And let me just do the following. So we have our one-dimensional system again. And what we can do is we can do, uh, uh, we can just choose a particular representation of our um, state. So we can say that we do two Schmidt decompositions. We do one Schmidt decomposition at this bond. So we have the states alpha left. We have a site local i. And we have states beta right. So this does we have like a quantum state defined on this one dimensional system. We do two Schmidt decomposition, like one here, and we do one at this bond. And this gives us some Schmidt states for um, left of this bond. And this one, we get Schmidt state for everything right of this bond. And then we can clearly just write down our state in this way. And I just using now our notation alpha i n alpha, beta, alpha, left, i. OK, <laughs> uh, beta, right. OK, so if we have our, um, what? I forgot one of this. <laughs> OK. Uh, anyway, so, so we have basically our uh, system. We can just write it in, in this form uh, uh, in terms of, of these Schmidt states. Using this, like this is now directly related to our matrix product state formulation because we have our matrix product state um, that we can write in this form where we have here. So we have here basically our our gammas, and I just because I'm it's a lot of writing. I just keep in mind like if whenever there is a dot with three legs coming out, this is a gamma, and these dots with two legs coming out, this is a lambda. And now what we can do is we can just basically wipe this one open, and then um, these ones here are exactly our states L. And these ones are exactly our states uh, on the right. And uh, here we have our index uh, i. And here is an alpha, alpha. So you see that this gives us exactly um, this, this form back. Now, say that we want to calculate some expectation values. So say that we just uh, want to evaluate the expectation value uh, on side uh, M, which means in uh, this, using uh, again this notation here, we find that the operator acts only on, on this side here, but leaves all the other side unaltered. Then we find the following, namely uh, from this canonical form, we know that the the states that we have on the left and on the right, the gamma i, uh, like everything here is just forming uh, the identity because of the orthogonality. So we we have this condition that everything on the like if you just multiply the left transfer matrices 
we get just the identity back. If we just do the same from coming from the right infinity, we also get uh, the identity back. And then we just have here something sitting in the middle, which we then can write simply as this. So we have here our operator O acting on, on this side. We have gamma lambda squared lambda squared. OK. <laughs> to show a more beautiful picture of this. So what I hope to be able to show is that if we have matrix product states in, in this particular canonical form, it's now very easy to evaluate uh, local expectation values because of uh, um, having these identities. If we would not have these identities, we would have to multiply like infinitely matrices from the left, infinitely many matrices from the right, or the other way around, and uh, then we have to sandwich this local operator here. But because we have this nice identities, we actually know what the fixed point is coming from the right. We know what the fixed point is coming from the, from the left. And then we can just uh, plug in the fixed points, which are just the identities. And we can just simply evaluate these expectation values. And furthermore, looking at these expressions, we already see why this graphical representation is extremely useful. If I were to write down this in terms of uh, indices, I would probably spend the whole hour to, to do this. And it's getting even worse <laughs> when looking at uh, uh, kind of correlation functions, because then again, um, we can just take everything coming from the left and from the right using these identities, and then we obtain uh, the correlation functions. And one thing that we nicely see here is the following. If we calculate a correlation function between two operators, so maybe a spin operator acting here and a spin operator acting uh, here, then in between we have just powers of the uh, of the identity matrix, uh, sorry, of the transfer matrix, and we already know the the dominant eigenvector of this transfer matrix is the identity, which basically gives us the um, normalization of the state. We will find that the um, Kind of correlation functions or the, the correlations are then uh, related directly to the second largest eigenvalue of the transfer matrix. And this is what I, I'm shown here. So if, if you are interested in the correlation length of, of, the, uh, of your MPS, you can just construct the uh, transfer matrix. Uh, again, choose it such that it's uh, in this canonical form, so that the dominant eigenvalue is, uh, is 1, then we find that the correlation length in your state is actually just given by minus 1 divided by log of the second largest uh, eigenvalue. And again, this can be uh, argued, on a set of, uh, the argument for this is similar to what we had before about the um, power method. Good. And let me now come to this exception to those states where things become a bit more tricky. And these are so-called uh, cat states. Because if, if you happen to have something which we call a cat state, which means like we have quantum states formed by superpositions of sort of macroscopic states, then, the, um, uh, then this is not strictly true. But instead, we will find that there are in this case, two dominant eigenvalues that have an eigenvalue 1. And we can actually then think of having uh, everything split up into two blocks. We have one block for the cat alive and one block for the dead cat. And uh, in, in each block individually, the same things apply that I was describing. Good. Is this uh, roughly clear? Or so, so what I wanted to say with the last few slides is having this canonical form, the great thing is that it's very easy to calculate uh, 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 local expectation values. And also, we can obtain correlation functions very simply. In the expression for the correlation functions, we notice that the correlations decay uh, um, based on the uh, eigenvalues of the transfer matrix, because the transfer matrix is just uh, 
uh, basically the collation functions are calculated by taking some left vector, some right vector, and sandwiched in between the uh, transfer matrix to the power of uh, L, L being the difference between these two sites. And based on this, we can actually see that the longest correlation length in the system is actually just related to the second largest eigenvalue of this uh, transfer matrix. And this is actually, again, in practice, when you're using these techniques, very useful because you just find your matrix product state, you construct this transfer matrix by just gluing together those matrices, and then you can just read off the uh, correlation length, for example, that will help you to find critical points. Let me now demonstrate for the remaining minutes um, these, um, these states in action. And this is also something that you will do yourself in uh, the tutorial session. And the example model that I want to look at is the uh, transverse field Ising model. And this is the transverse field Ising model. Uh, uh, has just the um, Ising term, so we have nearest neighbor ferromagnetic Ising coupling, and we have a trans transverse field uh, here. Now, if I uh, uh, tune this vari variable G, the system at some point undergoes a phase transition. And uh, because of this, I think this is the uh, a fruit fly for studying these um, kind of many body Hamiltonians, because this is one of the rare cases where we actually have an exact solution. So we can just compare whatever we uh, obtain to the exact solutions. Plus, it has quite some interesting um, physics in it. So, so again, if G is very small, the system is in a symmetry broken uh, sort of ordered phase. And then at some point, there's a phase transition into a, a paramagnetic phase. And, uh, then, in order to distinguish these different phases, we can measure the magnetization as an order parameter. Uh, and uh, this is like, uh, would be like the first task that we can do. We could say that, well, we can now use this algorithm. So we can just write down an uh, infinite matrix product state and uh, use DMIG to optimize the, uh, the energies. So we just optimize the energy uh, um, with a given kind of trial state where we just uh, kind of improve the quality of the trial state by increasing the, the bond dimension here. So, and, and here we just uh, have a, a plot where here we tune the correlation, uh, the, um, the, the coupling, and here we plot the um, magnetization. And one thing that we um, uh, um, notice is that, first of all, the, the solution that the algorithm finds actually um, spontaneously breaks the symmetry. And that's very remarkable because if we were to do, use some finite state algorithm, you would never find a symmetry broken uh, solution. But these infinite systems, because they actually have a certain dynamic system, the algorithm finds a symmetry broken state. So we, it spontaneously chooses a, a magnetization of plus or minus um, one and then sticks in, in, in that particular state. And then we see at some point the magnetization uh, drops to zero. And what we see here as we improve the or increase the bond dimension, we see that the transition point on this scale slightly shifts. So if chi is two, it's just shifted to slightly larger values. But already for chi equals larger than five, it, at least on this scale, um, the position of this critical point uh, does not uh, shift, shift anymore. And again, all that is uh, done here is writing down this infinite system MPS uh, ansatz, use DMRG to minimize the energy, and then we use this uh, trick that I tried to uh, illustrate here to calculate the expectation value of the magnetization, and this is what we get. And uh, I think this was uh, Ruben uh, Vazin, who was from my group, who did these calculations, um, testing the tutorial. Good, and uh, this you can just do it tomorrow yourself. So. Let me just uh, point out one uh, interesting fact, is that um, going back to, to this model, if we are at this critical point, we would actually find that at this critical point, the correlation length is diverging. So we have an, at this critical point, the correlation length is actually infinite. So, uh, so basically, if I plot the correlation length as a system, as a function of g, like as a parameter, we would expect that this is actually in, actually infinite at this critical point. 
Good. However, um, just what I've shown earlier, like how, how we can, I, uh, um, I showed you this expression for how to obtain the correlation length for a matrix product state. We saw that for, uh, for any, any matrix product state with a finite bond dimension, the state will have a finite bond term. It will always have a finite uh, correlation length, right? Because basically, just from the construction, you see that the, um, uh, under the state is a cat state, the second largest eigenvalue is always smaller than the largest one, and then the correlations always decay exponentially with the, uh, uh, with the difference between the first and the second largest uh, eigenvalue. And, uh, and so it's always finite. And, 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 and then that means that at this critical point, we can never find a perfect approximation of the ground state in terms of an infinite matrix product state. And in fact, what we're going to find, or what we expect to find, is that as we increase the matrix dimension, we will actually find that we can get closer and closer to the critical point and actually faithfully uh, capturing the correlation lengths in the MPS. So, and this is now exactly the case. If we um, actually do this uh, uh, simulation, we construct the transfer matrix and then get the um, correlation length. We see that as we increase the bond dimension, the correlation length near the critical point is actually diverging. Uh, but only, yeah, but for any finite matrix dimension, we find that this is uh, remaining finite. And this is, is a, well, in, in a way, this is a weakness of these MPS or INPS because we cannot really capture two dimensional, we cannot really capture. Uh, the physics of, of critical states, there's always some cutoff uh, um, given by the MPS dimension. But in a way, we can also use this uh, um, for us, namely, we can do the following. We can go to a particular critical point that we are interested in. So for example, the Ising critical point. And many of these critical points we are interested in, they are described by um, conformal field theories. And I'm not going to describe what conformal field theories are at this point. However, there's one characteristic uh, number, namely the uh, uh, central charge. And the central charge is effectively counting the number of uh, linearly dispersing modes. And this is a number characterizing these um, kind of conformally invariant critical points. So, and there's a nice relation derived by Calabrese and Cardi some, some years ago, namely that if you detune a critical point a little bit to so introduce a finite temperature or like a finite uh, correlation length, then the, uh, then the entanglement is scaling as c divided by 6 times log, log of the correlation length. So what we can do now, if we just want to use this infinite systems to study a uh, critical point, if we want interested in what, what, what might be the uh, central charge, what we can do is we can just redo a simulation at the critical point with various bond dimensions. So we just increase the bond dimension and then independently measure the correlation length and measure the uh, entanglement entropy. Right? Recall the correlation length we can just get by diagonalizing the transfer matrix and the entanglement entropy we just get from the Schmidt values that we anyways uh, have at uh, our disposal. So, and then if we just do the plot here, we see actually this logarithmic dependence. And just by fitting it uh, for a couple of points, we can get a quite good estimate of the, uh, of the central charge. So, this, let me see. So, the lecture should go to about now, or what is the, uh, okay, well, I, could take maybe a few questions if there are some. Otherwise, I could just give you a rough overview about the ideas for topological order. But maybe there are some questions. Yes? OK, good question. Uh, so there are two, two answers to this, I guess. I mean, well. I mean, the first answer, nothing prevents me from doing this. Um, and then there are two ways that this is actually um, uh, done. So the first uh, thing is that we can do, well, we stick relatively closely to what I'm doing here. And we are just 
looking at systems where we take only one of these dimensions to, uh, to infinity. I can just say that, well, I'm doing a simulation on some, 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 some two-dimensional slab. So I say that I have a dimension like x and uh, uh, x and y. And I'm saying that I'm taking uh, x to, to infinity uh, and, and y I keep finite. And then I can just uh, use something which I think also Steve White introduced. We can just uh, use some sort of MPS snake going through the system. And I can, again, so, so here are the, the sides of the system. And now I have now some sort of a quasi one dimensional system. And then I can use exactly the same trick that I've shown before. I can say that, well, we define basically some sort of a unit cell that always repeats. And then by this, I have a half infinite system in terms of uh, like the, the, the two dimensional system. This is the, um, the cheap answer, like very closely related, basically a one to one generalization of what I just showing. The, the second point is we can again, we can use generalizations of matrix product states to, to 2D, namely that we say that, well, we actually uh, construct the system where instead of these uh, uh, comps, we get brushes, <laughs> something like this. And here again, we can play the same trick of going to infinite systems by saying that, well, we have a uh, um, kind of unit cell that just keeps repeating, and then one just uh, optimizes uh, the same MPS again. And in fact, this has a name. It's called IPEPS, um, like infinite projected entangled pair state. And it might be that Bila Bauer is talking about this. But the, in, 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 in very short, I mean, this is a very powerful approach because it would capture the area law and it would allow to describe infinitely large systems. However, the problem is that uh, um, while for 1D, in particular, using this canonical form, we have a very good handle on calculating, for example, uh, uh, local expectation values. I mean, that's why I'm also very happy about this one here, because it's extremely simple so if you have an MPS to calculate your local expectation values. Doing this for these 2D systems is still uh, in a uh, kind of complex and an unsolvable problem. If for for one D or for two D, for two D even even uh, even calculating the norm of a PEPS is I think uh, is maybe an NP hard problem. So if you just I mean that I find um, actually quite amusing. So if if you have some friend who uh, uh, is very good in doing numerics and he just gives you the MPS for your problem, he says like well this is a solution of your Hamiltonian and I, I just send you an MPS then you are super happy because you can calculate whatever you want. If you have another friend who just gives you the 2D PEPs, he just gives you the, the PEPs representation of your ground state, you're still not very happy because even though you have the PEPs, it's still NP hard to, for example, calculate even the norm of the state. So you will again need to rely on approximations just to calculate the norm of the state. You may have to go through the whole to get the norm of the state. Exactly, yeah. But I think it might be that Bela Bauer is, is talking about this in, in more detail. But there's, I mean, this is currently a lot of research going on, like on new ideas. How can we actually uh, efficiently approximate or simulate these 2D systems? That's still not completely agreed on what the best way would be. Yeah. Um, what about Mira? Mira is yet a, adding uh, a different idea. So, <laughs> in in terms of pictures, so MPS. Basically, this is like what I've drawn 20 times or more in this. So this is like the MPS. So we just basically correlate or entangle sites uh, just through this uh, chain of MPS that we are multiplying. Mirror, like this is um, MPS. And if we do mirror, we again have some sort of physical space. But the idea that we introduce basically the entanglement is by some network that's extending in, in this direction. Oops. Oh, thanks. Uh, so, and in Mira, we just say that, well, we could have, we have here some spins or some, some degrees of freedom. And then we have a network of, on the one hand, we have so-called disentanglers. 
so these ones here would try to disentangle the spins here, or adding entanglement between these spins. And then we have some sort of coarse graining step. So we just go to a system that has fewer sites. And then, again, we can just add disentanglers, and then we just pick, go up and so on. So in short, for MPS, we just have like a simple framework where we just carry all the entanglement by multiplying these matrices. For MIRA, we have some sort of a uh, uh, network that extends into one more dimension. And then there are certain differences. Maybe the only thing I want to say is for MPS, they only can describe states that have an area law. As I showed with this plot here, for example, we cannot describe a 1D critical state for an infinite system because we need the entanglement to be constant, and here it's growing logarithmically. For MIRA, if you look for a like a graphical picture, if you look how spins can be entangled over, over long distances, you can actually you find that this logarithmic growth of the entanglement entropy is captured by MIRA. So MIRA can actually represent a critical state. So, but on the computational side, again, MIRA becomes very difficult to, to handle. And that's why, uh, uh, yeah. I think this is a very interesting approach, but so far it uh, uh, hasn't been able to replace MPS. <laughs> more questions? Then we go for a coffee break?